Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Bland, pastor to the deaf here at TGP. And uh, my brief sermon this morning is entitled Real Hope in the Middle of Chaos. It's based on 1 Peter 1.21, and I'll read that for you. Though Jesus, uh, through Jesus, you believe in God, who raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him, so that your faith and hope are in God. We all have plans. We all have plans. Work plans, summer plans, retirement plans. I just learned this morning that one man is going to retire in 10 days. House plans, yard plans, education plans, worship plans, child care plans, sports plans. And yet, plans are not always the, happen the way we plan. All of us are used to small interruptions in our plans. But living with major interruptions like the pandemic COVID-19 that we're presently in is completely beyond normal. During this pandemic, each day, you know and I know that our normal life is challenged more and more. It is upsetting. It is overwhelming and sometimes downright scary. And sometimes it may even feel like there is no hope. In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, God tells us, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Throughout history, God has periodically reminded us, mankind, worldwide, that he is still in control. And we have several examples. The worldwide flood found in Genesis chapters six through nine. Israel's escape from Egypt, found in Exodus chapters 3 through 16. Then we have Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And now this world pandemic. The world's best minds in medicine and biosciences had no knowledge about COVID-19. Only educated guesses based on flu-like diseases. Chaos quickly became the normal. All seemed out of control. Stores closed. Food became scarce, along with other necessary things. Even our churches shut down. The one place people turned to during crises or chaos. My wife and I quickly learned that because of our ages and health, we were not supposed to go out of our house at all. This presented an immediate problem for us. What about food and our medicines? We began to pray for God to care for us and keep us safe as he did for the Israelites during their escape from Egypt, supplying them with food, water, and shoes that lasted during their 40-year exodus to the promised land. We remembered God tells us in Hebrews 6, verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And then 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So what that tells us, it is impossible for God to lie. And God cannot deny himself, which means God cannot break his promises. And that is a blessing for everyone here. God faithfully supplied our food with two meals every day through the Onondaga County Emergency Senior Help Services, something that had never happened before. 
And initially, our medications were brought to us by younger people. While listening to people in general, watching the news, or just hearing different reports, different people talking, one thing became obvious to me. Many people seem to be experiencing a different hope than us. There are really two different kinds of hope. The first hope is world hope. And it's mostly just wishful thinking, you know, crossed fingers, that something will happen. Hoping their money, their intellect, their strength, their best things, their youth, their happiness, their education will lead them through whatever happens. It was during this time that I heard so many people so scared that this was the beginning of the end, that this is the time that talks about in the Bible. We are born with this kind of hope, world hope, and that will not change without a change of our relationship with God. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine going through life with only crossed fingers hope. The second kind of hope is called Christian hope. And it is defined as confident expectation that God will take care of us as he promised, based on Luke 12, verses 22 and 30b. Verse 22 reads, And Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. And verse 30b reads, Your Father knows that you need them. So God our Father always knows what we need. In fact, more sooner than we know. We, we, we learn what we need. He already knows what we need. 1 Peter 1, 3 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We sang about that this morning. So we can have a living Christian hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember, 1 Peter 1.21 told us, your faith and your hope are in God. Again, we can have this Christian hope only as a result of a new relationship with God. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. John 1.12 tells us, But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Through God's grace, we hope, but not as the world hopes. We hope knowing without doubt that anyone who has accepted Jesus as their personal savior begins a new relationship with God, has the gift of eternal life, not will have, but has, and will have an awesome reunion in his presence. You know, the, the pandemic is still up with us. It's not over. We have simply learned to live alongside of it. And I cannot imagine going through life in this pandemic or other crises without that Christian hope. Which hope have you been experiencing? Today or any day that we're assembled, anyone on our ministry team will be happy to help you find that new relationship with God and have the right hope. Thank you, Pastor Bland. 
for reminding us that we need to put our hope in Jesus Christ alone. That's a great reminder today. I stand before you today a living example of how to apply that message to your life today. Let me explain. I'm kind of on an anniversary week right this week. September 3rd, 2019, I was pretty hopeless about my weight loss. I've always struggled with my weight, but this day was different than other days. I was very discouraged and hopeless. And I told God that I, how I felt and that I was hopeless. And I also prayed to him and said, I'm gonna put all my hope in you. That was a year ago. And with his help, I've lost 105 pounds this year. <laughs> we need to put our hope in God. I it's not a coincidence that I was asked to speak um, in this series. It's not a coincidence that I was given the third week that matches up with my anniversary week. It's not a coincidence that Steve Bland was paired with me. It's not a coincidence that he preached a message on putting our hope in the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying to you today? That we serve a mighty God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and if we put our hope in him, he will help us. Amen? What I need to hear right now is I need to hear my friend Clifford with a big hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, louder than that, Clifford. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> All right, let's wrap up. Thank you. Let's wrap. That's enough, Clifford. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can come in anytime you need to. Listen, let's wrap up this series. What has God taught me during this pandemic? Now, listen, I'm going to start off by telling you it's kind of scary that they've given me a mic that I can move around. That's kind of scary. Just be worried about that. What has God taught me? I'm an optimistic person by nature. I think that's my natural bend, but if it wasn't, when I open up my Bible and look at the Word of God and see my God and see Jesus Christ, I see him as positive, encouraging, and optimistic. So that's the kind of way I want to be. So I'm an optimistic person by nature, and so when I see things, I'm going to look for the good in every situation. Um, this pandemic's been bad in some ways, but it's also been good in some ways for me. Parts of this pandemic have been good for me. I'm okay with a little social distancing. I social distanced before it became popular. <laughs> Two weeks into this pandemic, I would talk to people and say, you know, it's really nice to see things getting back to normal. They would get a scowl on their face and they would go, what do you mean things getting back to normal? Well, I said, when I was a kid, I would see kids riding their bikes in the streets. I would see parents walking in the street. I would see kids playing board games with their family. I would see people eating together. I said, it's really nice to see things getting back to normal a little bit. So I'm okay with a little bit of that. This pandemic has been good for my family. Um, my wife has wanted to open up a, a business called Here to Go Mobile. My wife, Kathleen, is an audiologist, and for the layperson, that means she works with hearing and can get you hearing aids if you need those. But she wanted to open up a business, and it just never seemed to be able to work out because of the time. With this pandemic, she had the time to do it, and her business is called Here to Go Mobile, and she got it off the ground because of this. So she had, God gave her the time, and we see God's blessing in that. Parts of this pandemic have been even good for my marriage. I do most of the shopping in our home, I like to use coupons, I like to get sales, I, I like to get free gas, I do all of that stuff. And sometimes I get the products at a really good price, sometimes I get the products for free, and sometimes the grocery stores pay me to take their products. It's really fun. Um, so when I hit a sale, when I hit a product on sale, I stock up because I wanna have a lot of it before the sale comes back again. So when the pandemic hit, my basement was full of toilet paper. Before the COVID, my wife said, honey, are you sure we need this much toilet paper? Are you sure we need all, are you not overbuying? Are you not you know, shopping too much? You need to slow down. After COVID, she said, you're a genius gump. <laughs> so this pandemic has been good for my marriage. So what has God taught me? What has God taught me during this pandemic? It's this one thing. I need to stay close to Jesus. I need to stay close to Jesus. If you haven't used this pandemic to draw closer to Jesus Christ, then you have wasted this pandemic. If you have not used this pandemic to draw closer to Jesus Christ, then you have wasted this pandemic. If you have not used this pandemic to draw closer to Jesus Christ, it's not 
too late. If you got your Bibles and you want to turn with me, I would like for us to read Psalm 91. We're not going to stay there the whole time. We've got a couple of passages to look at, but we're going to start in Psalm 91. I will be reading out of the NIV. Psalm 91 and verse 1 says this. I'll give you a second. I, I don't like it when I'm trying to get my Bible opened up and the pastor goes too quick. I'm slower than all of you, so I need all the time. So I'll stall here and give you a chance to get there because I really want you to see the word yourself. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. I will, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to look at your word this morning. I pray that you would speak to us from your word. We need to hear your voice. I pray that you would help us not only be hearers of your word, but doers as well. And I ask this in the matchless name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen. amen. My message is entitled today, Staying Close is Better. Staying close is better. The closer we are to Jesus, the safer we're gonna be. The closer we are to Jesus, the safer we're gonna be. Psalm 91 is a promise about safety. Look at verse three with me. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. Sounds pretty good. That's a little safety right there. Look at verse five and six with me. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Psalm 91 is a psalm of safety. Look at verse 10. Then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. Psalm 91 is a promise of safety, but this safety is promised with a condition, and that condition is our safety is promised if we stay close to the Lord. Go back to Psalm 91 and verse 1 with me. Psalm 91 verse 1 says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That word dwells means that we need to remain. We need to abide. To dwell almost means that we kind of pitch a tent. We're going to stay there. We're going to stay close. He who dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Um, the other word in this verse that really talks to us about closeness is the word shadow. I like that resting in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm not big on the sun. If I'm going to find a picnic table, I want to make sure it's got shade. You know what I mean? So he, he will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. It's impossible to be in the shadow without being close to the object that's producing the shadow. I have a big oak tree in my backyard, and next to my oak tree is an Adirondack chair. And I've got that Adir I, I, I got that Adirondack close to the cheery already, but this year I even moved it closer because I like sitting in the shade in the shadow, and I want that I want to be as close as I can be to that tree. So I moved it a little closer. The, it's you. Look at that verse again. We'll rest in the shadow of the Almighty. If you want to be in the shadow or the shade of the Almighty, you got to be close to the Almighty. Amen. There's another verse in here that gives us a great picture of this closeness, and it's Psalm 91, verse 4a, and it says this, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. That's a great picture of closeness, a mother hen and her chick. Um, I've got some pictures I want to show you, because this is a great picture in God's word, but I want them to bring up some pictures for you to see. Now, I like this picture. That chick looks like it's doing pretty good. That little chick doesn't realize how dangerous the world is, 
How, has it lived long enough to know that, but mama knows. But that chick looks pretty good right there. Let's look at the second picture. I like this, I like this one. Now, you gotta look really close, but underneath there, there's a lot of legs under that mama. I think there's probably at least 21 legs in that photo. Think about it, think about it. <laughs> I can just picture this photo right before it was taken why all these chicks got under this mama. I think probably maybe a hawk was flying by or maybe a fox was coming too close and all of them were playing in the yard and all of a sudden they saw that hawk or that fox and they scurried under mama for some protection. But they gotta stay close if they wanna be safe. Look at this last picture. Now this last picture, that's probably more what I look like um, under God's feathers. Um, that's kind of the way I view myself. Um, but even puppies seem to be safe under there, don't they? Um, he seems to be taking a nap. He's probably nice and warm. And um, he looks very content because he's close and he's safe. Um, the other thing I like about this picture is the little chick on the outside. You know, that chick's got to be going like, come on, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Listen, the closer we are to Jesus, the safer we're going to be. The closer we are to Jesus, the more fruitful we're going to be. I want you to go in your minds with me right now to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is Jesus teaching the parable about the, the vine and the branches, right? In John chapter 15, verse 5, he says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The branch has to be close to the vine. Literally, it has to be really close. It has to be connected to the vine. You don't see branches laying around on the ground producing fruit. They have to be connected. They have to be close. The closer we are to Jesus, the more fruitful we're going to be. The branch can produce fruit if it remains in the vine. Jesus said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Branches cannot produce fruit by themselves. John 15, 5, the last part says, apart, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus wants us to produce fruit in our own lives. Galatians 5.22 reminds us of the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God wants to produce that fruit in our lives. I would take any one of those any day. Be fine with me. Just goodness would be good. Patience. How about a little love, peace? God wants to produce those, and he can do that if we remain close to him. Jesus wants to produce fruit in our own lives, but he also wants to produce that fruit in others' lives. And what I mean by that is he wants us to be a fruitful witness. He wants us to, to share the gospel with others who need to hear that Jesus loves them and died for them. The closer we are to Jesus, the safer we're going to be. The closer we are to Jesus, the more fruitful we're going to be. And the closer we are to Jesus, the better witness we're going to be. We're gonna be a better witness if we stay close to Jesus. Now, I wanna read Acts chapter four, verses 12 and 13, but I wanna give you just a little bit of a run and start to get to that verse, that, those two verses we're gonna read in Acts chapter four. Acts chapter one, Jesus has died on the cross and risen again, and he's appearing to his disciples. And in Acts chapter one, he's gonna ascend back to heaven, and he's gonna be in the clouds, and the men are standing there looking up into the clouds, and the two men in white robes say, men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking into the clouds? The saint Jesus is coming back the way he went in. So why are you standing here? It's time to get to work. It's time to get busy doing what God needs you to do. Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit is given at Pentecost and the church age begins. Acts chapter three, Peter and John are headed to the temple to worship. And as they're going in, they see a crippled beggar and the crippled beggar is, looks at them and they look at him and Peter says to him, silver and gold I have, I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. Rise up and walk. They healed the crippled beggar. He's running and jumping and praising God in the temple. Peter and John are probably pretty excited. The man who's now running and jumping, who couldn't run and jump before, is probably pretty excited. All the people are pretty excited, but the people who aren't excited are the religious leaders, those who don't know Christ. And that's where we come to in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Just to let you know, it was late in the afternoon, so they, they threw Peter and John into jail. And we're going to deal with that the next day. Here's what Peter is saying in verse 12 of Acts chapter 4. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, this is the day of salvation. Please come to know him. Please seek him out. I had to get that in there because I just liked it. <laughs> 
Verse 13 says this, so salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. These unsaved religious leaders who wanna get rid of these guys took note that these men had been with Jesus. Listen, the unsaved are always watching us. The unsaved can see Jesus in us if we remain close to him. The closer we are to Jesus, the safer we're gonna be. The closer to Jesus, the more fruitful we're gonna be. And the closer to Jesus, the the better witness we're gonna be. I wanna wrap this this message up today in in a passage in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 to 42, we read these words. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. He, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We all have a, amen, we all have a choice to make. Mary chose what was better, and we, have to, we need to make a choice every day of our lives, today and tomorrow and every day. Mary has chosen, and it will not be taken away from her. Listen, James chapter four, verse eight, gives us a great promise from God's word. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What a wonderful promise. The hymn writer wrote it like this. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. No matter, no matter, thank you, Cliff. No matter what the situation we face each day, may our goal always be to draw closer to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me?